It's tremendous to see a uh, you know, good spread of uh, disciplines uh, in the audience today. I think we've covered most of the divisions of the University of Oxford. We've transcended Oxford, so I'm very pleased to see international visitors today from continental Europe and from New York. Uh, it's tremendous uh, to have everyone together. Christine, as you know, is working on her new book and sort of rehearsing the, the, the chapters on us as she, as she goes. So we've had a series of talks in the Internet Institute here, but jointly hosting Christine with Leila and her sabbatical. And uh, this is the next instalment in, in that respect. So, um, welcome Christine. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. It's a great um, honor and privilege, and there's no place like Oxford where you can get an audience to try out your ideas as, as chapter by chapter. And I have bravely been committing a couple months in advance with paragraphs around what I think I'm going to have written by the time of the talk. So these are very much uh, works in progress and ones to provoke ideas and discussion. I also try to use a talk to, to outline a chapter. In this case, I've got at least 40 pages of notes for a 40-page chapter. So getting it down to something um, that is well-structured and organized is part of the challenge for today. I, I put up the copy of my, uh, the cover of my last book, which I wrote on my pre previous sabbatical here at the Internet Institute before the E-Research Center existed, just, just as it was forming at that time. Uh, because I, I broached the first part of these issues on sharing and reusing and finding and going back to those in, uh, in some ways. So the sharing and reusing problem is, I tried to frame also in this article that came out last year, and set it up as, as a two-sided problem. If data are going to be reused or repurposed, the people who are producing the data are going to have to make them available and do so in a way that other people are going to be able to interpret them and, find, and locate them, discover them, retrieve them uh, in something that they can make sense of uh, farther down the way. So that, that's where the setup of, of thinking about where we're going. So I want to talk first about how much this really is a paradigm shift uh, what some of the arguments are for sharing data, why it's so difficult, and then to the extent that we understand some success factors, and this is a surprisingly unstudied area, uh, I'm going to propose some of the things that, that people uh, who are spending a lot of time thinking these things are talking about. And there's going to be much talk here in Oxford in the next couple of days. Tomorrow is the uh, just sponsored data publishing meeting. Peter Fox is our keynoter tomorrow. Amy Brand is part of that. Uh, the Orchid and Dryad meetings are joint Thursday, and then there's other meetings Friday as part of all of this. So there's quite a bit of action, and people are coming here uh, to be part of the discussion. So um, paradigm shift. This slide you may have seen before. I got it from Ian Foster, and we both used it to make probably some different points. So the, the fourth paradigm uh, is the Jim Gray's phrase. Uh, Tony Hay uses it quite a bit. And it's the notion that over the centuries of science, we've gone from very empirically based, more theoretically based. Von Neumann brought us closer to simulation and computational models. Jim Gray, the um, you know, late lamented uh, Jim Gray, uh, who built much of the technology behind the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and other major database projects a Turing Award winner, uh, noted with this slide at the great volume and increase of data and how it's beginning to swamp different fields. Now this George Ergovsky, another partner of ours, an uh, astrophysicist at Caltech, uh, said this that the computer science is playing the role that mathematics did. And I think that's certainly true to a certain extent, and especially in the sciences, and I'll talk about that farther down, we get to the point about the difficulty of separating the data from the computation that lies under it. So you've got something that's actually shareable and reusable. Now, this is it's a bit glib. I mean, it's a nice way of thinking about the change. It's a little too technology-driven to say it's you know, the technology is what's causing change. But I think what, what is fair to say is we've got a real shift toward much more openness in science. And science has always been about sharing your work with other people. It doesn't count until it's peer-reviewed, until it's published. And 
and this is a more extreme case where we're going, is expecting the people to share not just the final publication, but the pieces that are underneath it. The considerations vary in terms of use and reuse of data, uh, where you are on the long tail. When I, uh, my talk in March, we spent quite a bit of time on thinking about the differences in characteristics of data and practices and uses between people in, say, astronomy and physics, who are here, you've got maybe 10,000 known astronomers in the world who deal with um, terabytes, even petabytes of data. And then out here, you've got our researchers in the Center for Embedded Network Sensing who might be working with a few megabytes, but it's actually very particularized local data that uh, is in many ways harder to work with because it doesn't, it's not amenable to any real standards for structure, for metadata, for ontologies. So the considerations are quite a bit different depending on where you fall along that tail. Uh, the title of the book that I'm working on now is called Big Data, Little Data, No Data. So big data is that, those large volumes of data, but large is, or big data is, is a scale-free problem. It's not absolute numbers or volumes of data. It's not whether you've got megabytes or petabytes or exabytes. It's about whether you've reached a point where you have more data than you know what to do with, that you can digest, that you can read, that you can see. You get dependent on computers to visualize it. You have qualitatively different approaches to asking questions. Little data is small volumes of data, but tends to be much more complex. And things that are, the big, the big data, little data is also part of the big science, little science metaphor from uh, Derek DeSoto Price, the great historian of science, who died in 1981 before he was beginning to deal with the scope of data we have today. No data is the case where either the data were not released, were not shared for anyone else to inspect, or maybe they were released and made available but no one curated them in any sustainable way that you could get back to them later. And I'm claiming that no data is the norm. Very few data actually do get shared, very few actually get curated. How many people in this room have deposited the data of their latest research project for others to use? Peter, Donna, okay. Jonathan, not sure. How about some of your data? Okay. And this is a very sophisticated crowd, mind you. So I think that's probably not a typical response. Uh, you know, we, we talk a good line, but whether we actually are curating our data and making it available for other people to expect is something else entirely. Note that these data sharing imperatives that are coming down from the different funding agencies tend to be very closely tied to the open access publishing push. The exception is the National Science Foundation, and there's, of course, interesting politics there, uh, that the, the rest of these are, are pretty much tied. The, the RCUK policies that are you know, quite a controversy right now say you shall publish in open access journals if you're getting any RCUK funding, and oh, by the way, you also need to provide an indication of how your data can be accessed. NSF went for the data sharing requirements without an open access publishing requirement. This new federal policy, which has just been promulgated from the White House, is on open access to publications, is linked to data as well. So the, what the impression one would get is a continuity from publications to data. And part of my argument is that data are very different from publications, particularly different from journal articles. Now, there's, some, there's certainly some efforts right now to treat journal articles as mineable products, to treat them as data. And that, that's a different set of considerations than if you think about the role that books and journal articles have played in scholarly communication over those many centuries now, is we publish things to set priority. Those date stamps are very important. You know, who got there first? Uh, the trust is part of it that it was published in Nature or Science or another uh, well-known journal, you get much more credit than if you self-publish things. Uh, there's other kinds of legitimacy. There's a, a well-studied part of scholarly communication that says what journals do in this ecosystem. 
and data don't play that kind of role. We don't have good ways to evaluate them. We don't have good ways to do peer review of them. Uh, there's not the same kind of legitimacy, and there's certainly not the same kind of practices built in around authorship and curation and control and management. It's data management is not something you learn in graduate school. Writing journal articles is. So this movement toward data, <coughs> plenty of nice covers from Science, Nature, The Economist, uh, Wired Magazine, and such around around big data that suggests that you know, things like data are the gold standard, science replicability is key, and so on. And they're, they're not being viewed as a product that stands alone. You're expected to publish the article and publish the data. And it's, 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 not, it's simply not that simple, for lack of any uh, better, way, uh, better way to phrase it. And that's what I hope to convince you by the end of today. So part of the messiness, and we talked about this in March, is what, what are data and how that varies from field to field. Uh, the mouse. You might watch the mouse running around its patterns. You might slice up the uh, brain of the mouse. You might look at the genome of the mouse. You know, very, there's very, very many things you might do with it. We've got climate data. This would be ethnographic data, somebody's field notes. The images in astronomy and this are one kind of data. The spectra are yet another. Marie Curie's notebook might be of interest as an historical object. The science might be of interest. For handwriting may, may be of interest to the paleographers. You know, any of these objects is data in different ways to different people. I have a 40-page chapter called What Are Data? Just trying to unpack uh, the different things that, that could be data in different fields and the considerations that scholars go through in deciding what they might consider to be data, what might be a form of evidence about which they could make, they could make a claim. Oh, that's not showing up very well. Mm. If we take the lights down a little more, will we lose the video? That's not a concern. This is an important slide. Uh, what this slide is trying to show oops, okay, okay, is that, well, that's still not too good. Okay. I will talk you through the slide. Okay. It's a very pretty slide. Um, from a JSIST article from a couple of years ago. And what it does, this is from the embedded sensor networking uh, research that we've, we've done. And it talks you through where you might start a project of designing an experiment and associated with that you would calibrate your devices, you'd write a deployment plan, you would capture field notes, laboratory work, you might write a technical report, out of that process might come some kind of a raw data set, some amount of processing, uh, some models that you use to interpret it, uh, to come some cleaning analysis. Over here would be your writing processes, some manuscripts, some preprint you might put in archive, some postprint you might put in the Oxford Research Archive. Uh, there's different metadata, different materials, supplemental materials. Again, here the point is that your research is not just that journal article and the data set, you're throwing off all kinds of other artifacts in the process. And every one of those artifacts is important to interpret that data set that it might get deposited. The whole push on alt metrics right now is trying to capture kind of anything that can be counted through all of this. But in fact, again, in decades or more of studying scholarly communication, we see that much of the processes of scholarly work happen prior to the formal publication, distinguishing the formal and the informal. The informal would be the talks that you give, the, the work that you do, the, the things that go on by email, but now they're in blogs, they're in uh, open tagging, they're in Mendeley. There's lots of other ways you could capture these, but there's many other parts that go along to understand the scholarly process. Okay, so that's, that's my argument that we are in a real paradigm shift. Now the arguments for data sharing, again, I laid these four out in the, the conundrum paper and I'm developing them and tightening them up in, uh, in this chapter seven of the book. These are, 
these are my analysis of looking at the various arguments, particularly the ones from the funding agencies, from the publishers, and uh, from various activists trying to promote more open access to science. And this, so none of these are just one voice, but uh, certainly the first couple are, I say, more strongly to the funding agencies and uh, and the publishers. So I'm going to take the take us through these one at a time. The first one on the reproduce and verify, I gave a whole talk at OII just on, on this particular point to show how difficult it is. Arguably, this is the strongest reason to keep data and make them available, is so that other people can replicate, can verify, can validate the research. But it turns out to be very hard to do for a number of reasons. So, I mean, you even got the get another nice science special issue that defines what replication means, where this says data replication and reproducibility, even science can't agree on what terminology to use here as to whether it's a gold standard or this is high right, uh, also known as fool's gold. It's hard enough in the sciences. Uh, Victoria Stodd, the statistician at uh, Columbia University, makes this set of distinctions that in the deductive sciences and mathematics, you might check the proof. In experimental sciences, you might go back out and do the field work again. In the computational sciences, you might reconstruct the workflows, so the kind of thing that Dave and Carol Goebel and several of you here are doing about the workflow that would be very key to, to going out and doing the reproducibility. This is a slide that came out of that science one and it shows just layers of the different things that reproducibility might mean. Uh, do different techniques and platforms measure the same thing? Can other people repeat it? Do different data sets and meta-analysis get consistent results? Can uh, you validate it externally with different data sets and different teams? Is it clinically valid? Here's your, your, your um, evidence-based medicine issues. And then, does it actually improve clinical outcomes? This is the kind of thing that the big pharma is concerned, as well as, as the, medical, uh, the medical enterprise. So which of these and many other things you mean will certainly determine what, what reproducibility is. So people don't agree on what it means to do that, even within an individual science. It, the notion of reproducibility means even less when you get into the social sciences and the humanities. Secondly is uh, make the results of funded research available to the public. So this is the, uh, this is the responsibility of the taxpayers argument that you know, the, the British people, the US, the American people paid for this research to be done, therefore they should have access to the results. And that's certainly the argument be behind the open access to publications. I'm challenging whether that applies equally to data because it's one thing to do the research and write the article, it's quite something else to do the full data management, curation, deposit it, make it available for some period of years. And the policies are, are so far uh, not very clear. The, the British government appears to be doing a bit more on being specific about what data are to be included and how long they're to be kept than the, the, the US models are so far. But it's, it's a, I think it's, in many ways, an entirely different shift in terms of the workload responsibility to make data available over and above the effort that's involved in the research. And we have not figured out how to build that into the research process yet. The third one is to enable others to ask new questions of data that exist. And this is, to some extent, the, the big data argument. And this is what I get in the science friction. I, I hope it'll become clear how difficult this usually is. What it is you need to know about the data to make them useful? The arguments in Wired and, and other places around big data are saying things like the end of theory, uh, all we need is really good Correlations, correlations are good enough. We don't need causation. But anyone who knows the law of large numbers will know if you crunch enough numbers, you are going to get a certain number of correlations. And we need some theory to interpret them. 
and I find this a particularly dangerous route to go down and say, if we get enough data out there, you can find the correlations. The correlations may tell you where to look, but when we start believing correlations without looking for causation, I think we're getting into very dangerous ground. Um, I've got a slide near the end of something that we pulled together at this meeting, a Radcliffe seminar two weeks ago at Harvard on data provenance, and it was led by Elizabeth Goodman, the astronomer who was here, and uh, Xiaomi Meng, who uh, was chair of the Department of Statistics, is now dean of graduate division at uh, Harvard. And uh, Shaoli was saying, in many people are, will come to the statisticians and ask them to do the transformations and make the assumptions. The statisticians rightly say, well, where did these data come from? On what assumptions were they based? What do you know about the error bars and so on? What do you know about the imputations? What do you know about the missing data? And they say, oh, we don't know, but we trust those guys. And we trust you, just do it. Um, and this scares, this rightly scares him as a statistician. I think it should, I think it should scare all of us who think about, think about data. Um, fourthly, is to advance the state of research and innovation. This is the library argument. It's the data archive argument, and it's one that does work well in astronomy, which is if you curate the data better, if you invest in the data you can then leverage it and make it useful to other people and, and improve the science. The um, Chandra uh, groups at um, Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, uh, that I spent time with again a couple weeks ago, has a great statistics to show how the reuse of the data is greater than the initial use of it. But they've got a half a dozen people invested in curating those data, marking them up, adding metadata, and enriching those, enriching those data, enriching the publications about the data, putting them back into the astrophysics data system to make them discoverable and, uh, and reusable. So it's a massive investment uh, to do that, but you've got to decide which data are worth keeping and which data are worth, uh, are worth investing in. So, science friction and uh, data friction. I wish I could take uh, credit for that. It comes from Paul Edwards in a paper that we did jointly later. So we've got this whole push toward open data and sharing of data, but there's a whole lot of friction, a whole lot of pushback. And where's that pushback coming from? Well, that it's, it's simply not that easy. This is the mobility argument in the social studies of science that when you take data out of the context in which they were created, you have lost something. You've lost something very, very important. The whole process of taking data out of the environment in which they were generated makes them less meaningful, takes a lot of meaning away from them. It's very hard to know what they're going to be later. So let me just walk through these uh, quickly. The unruly objects argument, they are, they're very poorly bounded. All of those different kinds of objects that I had in that uh, washed out slide on the data life cycle, which of those is data? And, and at which point do you consider them to be data? Is it the signals coming off the telescopic instrument? Is it the reduced FITS files? Is it what comes out of the pipeline? Is it the samples in the lab? Is it the spreadsheet? Is it the tables of paper? All of those things are data. But it's very hard to say how you bound those objects and what exactly it is that they're going to share. Uh, Bruno Latour has long said they're malleable, mutable, um, mutable and mobile. They, they, they move across boundaries. They need different things when they go to another boundary. Uh, they don't stay still very long. And we certainly found in our study of looking at scientists and computer science and engineers look, working together in embedded network sensing, that what's signal to one group is noise to the other. The, the engineers will abstract away the science to figure out their targeting algorithms are working, and the scientists will ignore the help of, of the technical network if they trust their engineering partners make it work. So it's, each one's is something else, and they, they never get brought back together again. 
they don't stand alone. And this is much of what we spent the two days at the Radcliffe uh, seminar, which was a, a very interesting mix of astronomers, astrophysicists, computer scientists, information scientists, um, a psychologist, and what else? All of us, of course, wore, wore many hats in the process, about 15 of us. And what we really came away from is particularly this inseparability from code, that much of what you get out of any research project is, is a string of numbers or, or a set of images or a set of other kinds of objects that don't make sense without the software that made them. And people are even worse at sharing their code than they are at sharing their data, per se. So there needs to be more of a move on making the, the, the technical standards, making the software code available if those data are going to survive. And then, of course, the, the data themselves move. And this is you know, something Dave and Carol put a lot of work into with the workflows, is even if the workflow provides them on provenance, but the workflow itself is calling a bunch of other routines that themselves evolve. So you're, you know, your workflow is forever, and you're trying to deal with that. But it's a big, gnarly problem, because there's, there's so many parts to it. So coming back to use the data later, and actually knowing what transformations were made on them, and what decisions were made, will influence whether how useful they are. Even the astronomers at this meeting said, you often need to know why an image was taken to interpret it. It, it's not enough to know just what the coordinates are in the sky and, and what the calibration settings were. This is, the, again, the distance from origin problem is that people find it difficult to go back and use their own data a month later, a year later, and data tend to get dated by generations of graduate students or postdocs. I think that was like two years ago. If we can find so-and-so, maybe we can you know, resurrect these data. But it seems like the strongest argument for getting people to manage their data better is so they can use it themselves and, and find it. And, and that's the point of intervention at, at which the whole process is, is most vulnerable. If you can use it again, then maybe somebody else can use it again if you document it uh, later. So it's uh, your own reuse, your collaborators, your colleagues, but then when you start saying, well, let's put it in a repository with some amount of documentation, and somebody comes back a year later, a decade later, can they still make sense of it? And certainly things in print, libraries specialize in finding those things centuries later, but they're not um, Excel spreadsheets from who knows what generation of operating systems. Um, these I'm just going to knock off and say I'm not going to deal with these today, but I know they're there. We're not going to ignore them. Uh, the, there's pressure to release human subjects data. That's even hard. Scientific data is hard enough. Um, humanities data is hard enough. The social science data having to do with human subjects and the medical data is, is certainly the hardest of all. But I've got some on So. I want to wrap up and make plenty of time for discussion by talking about what some of these success factors um, might be. And again, to remind you that we're thinking about the, the two sides of the problem of whether people are going to release them in a usable way, which has a very strong determinant whether anybody else can make sense of them later. We found in our studies, particularly of the embedded sensor networks, that when data do get shared, it's because somebody sent them an email, called them on the phone, buttonholed them at a conference that says, I saw something interesting in your paper. That data set might be useful. May I have it and share it? You know, may I have it to compare to mine? That was the most likely chance that those data got shared. They would get shared between people they trusted and very often those data were used as, as what we're calling backgrounds, a kind of comparison as a reference point rather than the focal point of their, their research process per se. The, the highest quality is that if you can put your data in a place that will take them and will curate them will manage them and say it's up to slow standards and they'll check everything is there that says it is and you've got code books and such that go with it, that's you know, the NASA, which spends a fortune, the 
infrared, archi infrared data archive, IPAC, infrared processing analysis archive at Caltech has 180 people just taking care of infrared data. They've been there since 1983. They have their own two-story two building. Not many fields are making that level of investment in their data so they can get back to them. We have other kinds of archives, which we call author curated, where you, know, you vouch for it and put it in, but you don't have any professional curator checking it, managing it very much. You've got uh, data archives here. That's the Oxford Research Archive. Lots of people just throw it up on the website, which of course we know goes away, put FTP sites up, email it. Sometimes we find people are throwing things on their website uh, because of e the file's too big to send by email, or throwing the Dropbox, sending a link things like that. There's many ways that people share the data around. And keeping track of it is easier in the first case, but sharing is a lot of these other things too. Um, this uh, is what I chopped out and sort of reworked and reordered a bit from our, our working progress. What we decided to do on this two-day workshop was rather than write your usual white paper, we would write a 10 simple steps paper, which uh, Phil Bourne has been running for the PLOS Biology, and we checked with Phil and he said, yes, I would love to have it. So it's, it's, it's in process, and we're, we hope to finish it in May. But this is, this is roughly what we came out of, of two days of some people who are very immersed in data issues. To start with the premise that good science requires good data, now that's something that goes back centuries, is the sharing part that's new. Um, make your science inspectable so that others can judge the quality of your work. You've been expected to judge the quality of your journal article. Can you let other people see your workflow? Does everybody know what, what we mean by provenance? Yes? Sorry. Okay. Um, so provenance is provenance in the physical sense, uh, like the way museums use it, is more linear, is can you follow the chain of custody? So you, 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 if the Ashmolean wants to buy something, they want to know who's had it, there's a broken chain of custody, they don't trust it. In digital do documents, it's much more complicated because there's so many dimensions of, of provenance, of, of who's touched it, who's handled it, what transformation's been made on it. So if you think in terms of somebody looking at your data later and wanting to know everything that happened to it from the time it came off an instrument, and better yet, what the calibration of the instrument was, and what that, in, and what the description of the instrument is, and so on. You risk having an in, infinite regress. But at least if you could think about that shame, you're more likely to make sense of the data sometime later, and other people are more likely to make sense of it. <coughs> data reduction in astronomy, they do massive amounts of data reduction. They you know, throw away the noise. And in areas like physics, they throw away 99.9% .9 of apparently what comes out. Certainly, they hold up the filter, say we're looking for this, and everything else goes on the floor. So you've got to know what that what that filter is. And the statisticians were saying, don't do any more abstracting than you absolutely have to, because that you know, throwing away that noise also limits your ability to interpret what happened to it. Make it available. Make your workflows available. Publish the software, put it in GitHub, GitHub or some other place. This is a higher level of, of effort if you can foster a data community of people to work together. Describe how you want to be acknowledged and, um, and, and conversely attribute the sources of data that you use. Uh, worth a, a separate talk, but there's some real action going on about the attribution of data. So a big, uh, group from CoData and, and ICSD working on that particular problem and contributions because the difficulty of referencing data and getting credit for it is, is part of this whole, whole incentive problem. So, um, conclusion. This is what I think as of this morning, but we'll see what the rest of you think. So data reuse is part of the general idea of open science and open scholarship. We should think about it broadly. We should not underestimate what a strong paradigm shift this is in scholarly communication. We really are asking people to do things they've never been asked to in several years of scholarship. Uh, data are not the same as journal articles. They don't serve the same scholarly communication function. 
Yes, you can mine some kinds of them as data, but that's not the same thing as them being self-documenting in the sense that journal articles are. They are very messy. They are not bright, shiny objects. They change as they move through the environment. They evolve. They're dynamic. Sharing the data is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. So putting it out there as a data dump, and this is sort of the, the spirit of the law, letter of the law problem. We've had, we've asked people about their data sharing. They say, oh sure, I'll give it to anybody because I know that it's a complete mess and nobody else can make sense of it. So I get credit for throwing out you know, a really ugly Excel spreadsheet because I shared my data. But I may even have you know, put deliberate errors in it to see if it got, got reused or, or if anyone caught them. So just by getting it out there is not the same as putting out something that is, that is useful. The, the reuse depends on the conditions under which it's shared and the conditions under which you want to reuse it and what you need to know about it for your particular purposes. Data friction is, is part of scholarship. I mean, the, the, you know, the very fine, deep, tacit knowledge that you spent years, if not decades, developing is embedded in that process. You can't just lift it out of that process and pass it to somebody else. Anybody who's tried to pass it to a graduate student knows how difficult it is. These are not objects that transfer cleanly from one place to the next. Uh, better practices in managing the data. We hope will increase the, uh, the reuse of the data. Oops, I think there was one more point there. Um, maybe not. I guess that was all time. Okay. So we would hope that if you can if you can get early on the life cycle and get people to think about provenance, think about sharing, think about reuse, there's there are situations where data are more likely to get reused. Some people will share some of the data some of the time. Okay. So with thanks to much grant funding money from NSF and Sloan Foundation and uh, Microsoft and other places. Thank you.